Uh, okay, first thing we should check is Ravi, can you hear me in your ear? Oh. <laughs> right, you should hear me. Well, no, my, my earphones are uh, not so much. But, but can people can people out there give me give me a thumbs up, people? Out there. Yes, we're here. Okay, great. So I am on. Good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, I will, and I do. I will hear questions out loud, so you can interrupt me that way. But if you post things in chat, I'm going to assume Robbie is going to interrupt me. Necessarily. All right. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. So uh, first, a few uh, pr uh, practical things. First, this is a, a description of a joint project with Taylor Dupuy. Taylor is here, uh, and David Zurich Brown. I don't know if DZB is here. Um, we have a preprint posted on archive. Um, I also noticed that uh, Christelle is here. Uh, Christelle Vincent mentioned this paper in her Vantage seminar a few weeks ago. So if you heard that talk, that you can think of this as a continuation of that. Um, so as Ravi pointed out in the Zoom chat, uh, I'm writing on this live whiteboard uh, that you can follow with the link that I have posted here and that's also posted in the Zulip and in the Discord, um, which means that you can kind of go back to a previous slide if you want. Um, I will also post the entire uh, set of slides later on my website and I'll send them to Ravi to post to the seminar website. A reminder, I'm basically on campus, we're going for lunch afterwards. And even though I'm not there right now, I should acknowledge that my campus sits on the unceded ancestral land of the Kumayai Nation. Um, and I have financial support. All right, so now let me follow myself to my next slide here. Okay, so this talk is, is primarily gonna be about abelian varieties over finite fields. So let me just write down the key points you need to know. So if A is an abelian variety over some finite field FQ, then uh, it has associated to it a V polynomial, which is the characteristic polynomial of Fabanius uh, Q power, so geometric Fabanius acting on some say a tall cohomology with QL coefficients uh, doesn't really matter so much for this talk. We won't really be talking about those coefficients. So I'll just say it's the characteristic polynomial for on uh, H1. Uh, and let's see if this is of dimension G. Then this polynomial will have the form, it'll be a monic of degree 2G. Um, at some point, I'll get to the middle, and then uh, I'll start having a symmetry where I start seeing the coefficients again revert in reverse and with increasing factors of Q until I get to the bottom and I see the last coefficient for the factor of Q to the G. So it always has this form and its roots over C can always be listed in the form um, alpha one through alpha two G where alpha g plus i is equal to alpha i bar and the product of, and, and alpha i bar will always alpha i times alpha i bar will always be q or in other words alpha i has absolute value somebody has a mic open i don't know if that's on purpose um, i guess not because i didn't ask a question um, so uh, right, so this is, so to speak, Bayes Riemann hypothesis for abelian varieties over finite fields. Uh, yeah, so this is Bayes statement of the Riemann hypothesis for abelian varieties over finite fields. Um, although I won't use that specifically in this talk, I'll mention that. You have the Honda Tate theorem, which says that there is basically a one-to-one a -one correspondence between isogeny classes of abelian varieties over this finite field and uh, QV polynomials, i.e. polynomials that satisfy all the implicit conditions here. They're degree 2G, they're monic, they have the symmetry, 
they have all their complex roots on the right circle and they have integer coefficients. So yeah, these are integers. Uh, I say basically because there's a there's a there's a bit of a fudge in the Honda Tate theorem. There are certain cases where a Vey polynomial doesn't give you an isogeny class over the field you expect, but only over a larger field. Um, most of what I'm going to say in this talk is actually insensitive to the base field extension, so it doesn't really matter that there's that. So you can just imagine that abelian varieties correspond up to isogeny correspond to Vey polynomials. Um, okay. So that's what we need to know. And now I want to show you um, the L a bit of the LMFDB, although I'm just going to do this as a static screenshot. I'm not going to poke into the database very much. Um, but you can uh, you can go over to the LMFDB if you want and, and poke around with this. So um, I don't I didn't write this on the slide. So let me just say that the the credits for this part of the LMFDB are uh, Taylor, myself, uh, David Rowe, and Christelle. Uh, so if, if you go to the LMFDB, you can find a table of isogeny classes of abelian varieties over finite fields. As I said, this is roughly speaking in one-to-one -one correspondence with a bunch of Vey polynomials, but um, here we've collected more geometric data uh, in addition to that. So you can search in various ways. And um, let me just go ahead and skip to an actual piece of data to show you what happens when you search. Um, so the, uh, maybe I'll just point out that you can go up to dimension six over F2, right? So dimension up to six, this is this dimension six is over F2. I'll show you an example of dimension six over F2. Over larger finite fields, we don't go as far because there's some obvious trade off. Uh, we don't want to have a huge amount of data that people aren't going to look at. So we, we cut things off somewhere. All right, now I have the data. So we have to scroll over to an example. So here's an example of a abelian variety of dimension six. Um, Uh, so you can see what we what's listed here is um, the L polynomial is just the V polynomial in reverse. It's called we call it that because this is the thing that you use to compute the L function of an abelian variety over a number field. Um, so, uh, but the V polynomial is just this thing in reverse. So there's a whole bunch of data that you can see uh, and. Uh, what I want to do in this talk is talk about the relationship between a couple of the pieces of data that you see on here. So for example, one thing you see here is the Newton polygon, which uh, we'll talk about more of in a moment. And another thing you see over here in this box on the right is this plot. What this plot is doing is it's showing you the arguments of the Frobenius eigenvalues. Remember those eigenvalues all have the same complex absolute value. So, um, the data of them is the same thing as the data of these point, this collection of points on a unit circle. Um, and so you can ask questions about the distribution of those points. In this talk, I want to ask about multiplicative relations among those numbers. That's somehow the thing that's going to be really relevant. Okay, so let me go ahead and start talking about one of the two things we just discussed. So let me focus on the bottom part of this picture. Um, we have the Newton polygon. So the Newton polygon of an abelian variety is, well, you have this characteristic polynomial of Frobenius. Um, so you just take the Newton polygon of this polynomial in the usual sense with respect to the prime P where Q is some power of P. So you take the Newton polygon for the p-adic valuation, but you normalize um, so that height one corresponds to the valuation of Q. So if you want, you say you normalize so that the valuation of Q is equal to one. 
And when you do that, uh, you always get the picture that looks like this. So here I have zero, zero, and here I have two G comma G, uh, right? Because I end with Q to the G. So this endpoint on the right uh, here is X coordinate two G, Y coordinate G. In the middle, I have some things that can happen. And there are a couple of extreme cases. Um, you know, one extreme case that can occur is that you go all the way out to G comma zero without lifting. And then you spend the rest of your time going straight up this way. Um, so this is called an ordinary Newton polygon. Uh, this is the generic case. This is generic and moduli. Uh, the other extreme is that you take a straight line from here to here. Um, this is called super singular. And this is the most degenerate case in moduli. So there's a, there's a stratification of say the moduli space of abelian varieties with a fixed degree polarization. Um, uh, it, has, it has a bunch of steps corresponding to the various intermediate polygons here. You can kind of step one, one right? These, these polygons are in correspondence with the lattice points above them. So you can kind of remove, uh, there's a symmetry kind of from left to right, but you know, up to that symmetry, you can kind of step one vertex at a time and there's a, um, I guess, a theorem by de Jong and Ort that says that as you step through in moduli kind of one point at a time, you drop in co-dimension by exactly one each time. So uh, that lets you figure out the dimension of any given um, Newton polygon stratum. Uh, and these are, again, these are, uh, these are isogeny invariants because they all, they're only determined by the Newton polygon. You can ask about there are, we don't have isomorphism invariants in the LMFDB yet because uh, computing the isomorphism classes associated to an isogeny class is doable in many cases, but is a, uh, is a problem that uh, Stefano Marcellia in particular has done a lot of work on, but that, that, that is not yet available. So, uh, but fortunately, I'm just going to be talking about isogeny invariants. Uh, yeah, so, uh, and right, super singular. Newton polygons turn out to be things that are very special. So a super singular abelian variety is always isogenous to a, um, a product of, of super singular elliptic curves. Um, uh, but we won't really use that specifically. So I won't say more about it. Okay, so the Newton polygon is one easy invariant to read off if you have the, uh, the characteristic polynomial for Banius. Uh, the angular rank is maybe a less familiar one, but it's also relatively easy to read off. And uh, it also turns out to be quite important. Uh, so the angular rank is defined as follows. So remember, I have alpha one through, let me go back to, go back to black actually. So I have alpha one. So these are the roots uh, of the Frobenius eigenvalues, say. And I'm going to think of these as, as complex numbers. So what I want to do is I'm looking for multiplicative relations between these. Of course, I know a few. I know that alpha i times alpha g plus i is always equal to q. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, so the angle rank is going to be defined as the Z rank of the abelian group generated by, um, so I'm going to use multiplicative notation here. So it's the, uh, the, abelian, uh, the abelian group generated by these complex numbers under multiplication. Uh, and then I'll divide out by the subgroup generated by Q. Um, so, so why are you calling it the angle rank? You mean the same rank question? So the angle, yeah. So why is this called the angle rank, Ruby asks. Well, um, right, you can think of this in terms of arguments, right? What I'm real, because all of these numbers have the same absolute value. So, um, right, if, if you think about the multiplicative structure of complex numbers in terms of uh, um, arguments, 
and 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 absolute values. I can kind of I can kind of ignore the. Um, you can rewrite this just in terms of right. Another way to say this is. This is the rank of uh, z times the argument of alpha one. So that you think of this as an additive group now. Um, so I'm gonna get rid of the, abs the factor of Q entirely so by just taking argument. But now what I should do here is, of course, there's an ambiguity in the argument. So I should divide by the, the group generated by two pi. Um, so I guess there's a lemma that's not so difficult to check that these two are equal. Um, um, so this is the reason that I call it the angle rank because these arguments are angles. Um, but this is the this is the thing that that will come up when I relate this to the take conjecture in, in about one slot. So I want you to keep in mind that there's a kind of multiplicative notation in an additive notation. The additive notation is is where the term angle rank is coming from, but it's the same data just presented two different ways. Okay, I should say generically, um, so I, I cut it off here in this picture. Um, so in the LMFDB, the angle rank appears here. At the moment, um, these are uh, listed as numerical computations because you know what we did was we, we kind of computed these arguments to many decimal places and kind of looked and, and checked um, for relations um, you know, that have relatively small coefficients. And once we found all those, we assumed we were done. Uh, it is possible to turn that into a rigorous computation um, that is in progress, I believe. Um, so sooner or later, these will actually be confirmed rigorously. Any given one, it's not so difficult, but there's a lot of, a lot of data. It's not, it's not, actually, that sounds pretty tricky. Oh, I see, you know what the alphas are. Yeah, these alphas are not, right. So it's, it's not so tricky to, to turn this into a rigorous computation because these are, these are exact algebraic numbers. Yeah. Um, the, the, the thing is that they live in some large, I mean, when you take them all together, I mean, any one of them generates a degree 2G number field over Q, which is not so bad. But together, they generate a number field whose degree is more like G factorial times right. 2G, uh, or G factorial times 2 to the G. We'll see that Galois group a little bit later, which is kind of large. So you don't want to work in that number field, but there are ways around this. Um, so there are decent algorithms for, for computing this rigorously. Um, and at, by, maybe by the end, I'll even say something about one of the theorems that we get um, does help with that. Because you can, you can get some effective upper bound on the, on, the, on the size of the numbers that appear in one of these uh, additive relations. Um, that, that, that bound is still not so great for computation, but it, it shows you that at least this is a, a, an effective, uh, it is an effective problem to, to compute this angle. Okay. Uh, so I mentioned the take conjecture. So let's talk about that. It's a reason why people were looking at this is because it has to do with take conjecture. Right? So the take conjecture says, uh, just to say this in a kind of casual way, it says that. Um, so the take conjecture, I'll just state it for A. It's a statement about arbitrary abelian varieties over a finite field, but. I'm just interested in the case for an abelian variety. Um, so it says that the eigenvalue Q to the I on a tau cohomology, say in degree two I, um, is entirely explained by cycle classes, meaning that every cycle class gives you uh, an eigenvector with eigenvalue q to the i. And uh, the take conjecture is telling you that this explains all of the appearances of this eigenvalue. So in particular, um, this generalized eigenspace is a true eigenspace, and it's spanned by the image of the cycle class map in, in co-dimension R. Um, this is true. For i equals one, uh, this was proved by Tate, and this is uh, this is of course comparable.
to the situation with the Hodge conjecture. The Hodge conjecture says that uh, you know integral or rational um, classes that are also ii classes are entirely explained by cycle classes, and that's true for i equals one by the Lefschetz one one theorem. Um, so for kind of different reasons, but but in the end the same thing happens. You know this for i equals one, and and, and therefore it's also true. Um, for any i for which all uh, cycle classes, or, or so all, um, yeah, all cycle classes are supposed to be generated in degree one, or generated in co-dimension one, I should say. And this happens if and only if the angle rank um, is equal to G. Right, the angle rank is at least at most G because, well, I gave you two G generators, but there was an obvious redundancy between the conjugate pairs. So the worst that the angle rank, could, or the most that the angle rank could be is G. This is actually considered good because when angle rank is G, then the take conjecture is true. Um, and this is what happens generically. So uh, the take Can conjecture I is true for a generic abelian variety over a finite field. Karan, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Is that Bjorn? Oh, when you, yeah, when you say it's also true for any A for which all cycle classes are generated in co dimensional one, I mean, do you, I would think that you meant that you, that you, that all the, um, all the eigenvalues, um, I mean, how do you, I mean, yeah, sorry, I should say all, all Q to the I eigenvalues are, well, I mean, this, okay, what I wrote is not wrong, but yeah, it's better to say it this way. Well, it, I mean, I think it it's, is not yeah, well, it's not useful. Yeah, it's not useful. You just way know that the yeah. cycle class. I mean, the cycle classes are the ones for you all, where you already know the take take. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Take, so I let mean, me say it this way: it's it's it's, it's as long as you, you need to worry that there's some eigenvalue. Yeah, yeah. So Bjorn is complaining that instead of writing cycle classes here, I should say all the Q power eigenvalues are are a kind of you know come from the co-dimension one, so to speak. Uh, uh, or sort of sort of explain are explained in code are sort of explained by relations that occur in code dimension one. Um, anyway, the point is that uh, this, yeah, the, it, what so geometrically what this is saying is that if you take the cycle classes in degree one, um, which is the same thing as the Q, the eigenvalue Q classes because of Tate's theorem, and you take all the Q power eigenvalues, you know, um, occur are you know, in the linear span of the products of uh, Q eigenvalue, Q eigenvectors. So they're just to be generated in co-dimension one. Um, yeah, and it turns out this happens, this is a lemma by, I think this is Zarhin, maybe was the first person to write this down. Um, this happens if and only if the angle rank is, is equal to G and this is what happens generically. So the, the, so the conjecture is in fact true for a generic abelian variety, but, um, of course, if you have any particular abelian variety, um, you would like to know whether or not the Tate conjecture is true for easy reasons. And so, or if it's not, uh, you'd like to be able to identify the cases where you have to actually do some work on the Tate conjecture. So uh, there are a number of theorems that relate angle ranks to other things. And in particular, we've seen the angle rank in the Newton polygon um, I'm going to state in maybe two slides a theorem that tells you that certain Newton polygons tell you certain angle ranks. And so uh, one of the motivations for this study was seeing data coming out of the LMFDB. We weren't getting arbitrary combinations of Newton polygons and angle ranks, uh, and we knew there were some relations between them, and we wanted to try to explain those relations further. So, so, so a priori, there's no reason, no obvious reason for it. A priori, there is no obvious reason for a relation, except I will make one, I, I will give you one example of a relation that's maybe a source of motivation, which is that the following three things are all, um, well, no, the following two things are, are equivalent. A being super singular, so that's a, that was a Newton polygon property, that's equivalent to angle rank zero. Right, the angle rank is at least zero. And the only way it can be zero, it turns out, is to be super singular. 
um, this, this, this essentially boils down to an exercise um, in algebraic number theory. It boils down to Kronecker's theorem about uh, algebraic integers with uh, maximum absolute value one. Um, so this is a hint that angle, the very extreme case of angle rank is equivalent to a very extreme case of Newton polygon. So, th so this suggests that there might be some relationship, but the relationship is, uh, this suggests, th the relationship is not what this suggests in some sense. Because um, this is somehow saying that, yeah, yeah. In fact, what happens is most of the time saying something, most of the time saying something tells you that the angle rank is G because that's what happens generically. Uh, this is kind of a different relation, but there are, yeah. It's, it's hard to, it's hard to, so it's not like there's a monotone relation, uh, but there, there, there are definitely quite a bit of interplay between these two points. Um, so let me recall a theorem of Tonkaev from, uh, I don't remember when this is, but it's definitely uh, from Soviet times. Um, he published this in the Soviet journal, um, in Russia, of course. Um, okay, so suppose G, G is the dimension of my abelian variety. Um, so, yes. Oh, sorry, I need to, for the local audience and the Zoom audience, I need to move this over. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm always writing G for the dimension of my abelian variety. So Tonkaya proves the following, uh, apparently 1984, Oops. If G is prime, then uh, the angle rank of A is limited to very few possibilities. Um, well, I guess it could be, oh, sorry. And I'm assuming um, A is, I'm going to assume that A is absolutely irreducible from now on. You can talk about angle rank without this condition, but everything I'm going to say is in the absolute reducible case. So A is absolutely irreducible. So that, that's going to rule out angle rank zero because um, angle rank zero means super singular, means isogenous to a product of curves, which means absolutely irreducible only if dimension is one. Okay, so otherwise there would be a, that's why there's no zero here. Um, so the only possible angle ranks in this case are the generic one and two kind of uh, different exceptional cases, angle rank one or ang angle co-rank one. Um, uh, these can occur. So again, a priori, I, I see no reason why the finality of G should happen. Yeah, it's not obvious why G being prime imposes any condition on this. Well, we'll see a little bit later that th this, this angle rank has a lot to do with the Galois action on the roots of Frobenius. And that Galois action does have something to do with G being prime because it's, a, it's involving some transitive group action and transitive group actions when you have a prime are quite limited. So that's somehow, I mean, that's not how Tonkaya proved this theorem, but this is how we, we have sort of a, a uh, an approach to proving this and a few other theorems that, in our point of view, that's the reason why this theorem is true, is because you know, it, it, it somehow involves a transitive group action on a group of prime order. Um, yeah, so, and, and when, you, when you phrase it that way, we'll also let you ask the question, well, what can happen when G isn't prime? And it turns out, the short answer is it, it, that you need, you, you need to know sort of your finite group theory pretty well to be able to answer that question. Um, but what, roughly speaking, there are very few possibilities compared to what you naively expect from first principles. And this is some indication. So. Um, I'll also say a little bit later about how to eliminate these cases, because you really want to, you would really like to end up having angle rank G, because whenever you have angle rank G, you've proved a case of the Tate conjecture. So you expect that, mo and, and numerical data suggests that most of the time you get G, so let me explain that. But before I do that, I wanna, that, so that theorem doesn't involve Newton polygons. It's just the, I mean, it involves the Newton polygon in a kind of dumb way um, in that the Newton polygon does determine G. 
Um, but here's a more interesting example where the Newton polygon actually shows up. Actually, just before that, yeah. the, the A and G being take conjecture being true, it's not that it's even generally true, it's like a computable. I mean, it seems kind of surprising. Should I be surprised? Let's you should be are, 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 should you be surprised that the take conjecture is so is so it's that it's sort of relatively it's easy to verify the take conjecture in particular examples. Exactly. I mean perhaps i mean what i mean i guess the point is that right what makes the take conjecture hard or makes the hodge conjecture hard is when an out when, when an algebraic variety has weird cycles cycles that that you don't expect and uh, the, the the what i'm kind of getting at is that random varieties don't have weird cycles right but you're, but you're not just saying random like random to me is like general and i don't know what i don't know what general means because i'm not you're being agnostic what you're going on. Yeah. And here you're being effective. You're saying, check this thing. Check this thing. Which you can check. Which is numerical. And then this thing, yeah, I, this not thing will satisfy the take conjecture without having to understand, you know, higher degree cycles. Right. Yeah. I it's, that, it's, I find that surprising because I can't think of anything. If, the hot, if someone told me, yeah, the hot conjecture, yeah. Well, you know, abelian varieties are over finite fields are incredibly special. I mean, even even abelian varieties over C, uh, I think, is harder than this. I mean, like abelian varieties over finite fields basically correspond to CM abelian varieties over C. So these are very, very, very special abelian varieties. Okay. So and even so, it's a, that's quite a goal. Okay. Yeah. So abelian varieties over finite fields or CM abelian varieties over C, the, the Hodge conjecture can or can be tricky. But it, it's not tricky very often. And you can essentially do a numerical computation to identify whether you're in a case where things are tricky. Yeah. OK, so here's a theorem of Lenz to Zarhin. So this is going to give you not quite generic, but, but something very close to generic and moduli. So, um, so an abelian variety A is almost ordinary if it's Newton polygon. is the following. So I go from 0, 0 to g minus 1, 0. So I, so I have p rank g minus 1. And then uh, so I have slope 0 with multiplicity g minus 1. Then I have slope 1 half with multiplicity 2. So I get to g plus 1 comma 1. And then I have slope 1 the rest of the way. So right, the, the only point that's the only point that could be uh, on or above the Newton polygon it, that isn't is the point g comma zero. So this is so because of that, this is co-dimension one in moduli. Okay. So this is very close to being generic, and Lenstra and Zarhin proved in ninety three. that if A is almost ordinary, then uh, it has angle rank, well, they proved sort of two things. If G is even, then uh, angle rank equals G. If G is odd, then they don't quite get this. Um, it's at least G minus one. So if for G even, they really show that these things satisfy the day conjecture. G is odd, they kind of get close. Um, yeah, but this is saying, at least when G is even, this is saying there's a whole co-dimension one subspace in moduli where everything uh, is known to satisfy the day conjecture for easy reasons. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of cool. Um, I'll make a comment about this. So just to be clear, yes. ordinary does not imply angle rank G. Uh, right. In general, ordinary does not imply angle rank G. Um, you can find examples in the LMFDB, um, you know, because you can search both by the angle rank and by the Newton polygon. So you can do a search, um, and, and I'm still assuming absolutely irreducible. So you should also impose that condition. Um, so again, that's weird. Ordinary does not, but almost ordinary does. Yeah. 
it, it, it's weird, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's somehow because somehow ordinary is the, yeah. I'll, I'll sort of show you the, the, the gadget that, uh, that plays a role here. And, and it's sort of, it's sort of not useful in the ordinary case, but in this case, it's, it's doing something interesting. Uh, I'll make a comment. This also is, this is also true for more or less the same reason. Um, if the, um, if the Newton polygon slopes sort of look like this, look this, look like this too adequately. Just like, for example, if there's something like one third, one third, one third, one half, one half, uh, two thirds, two thirds, two thirds. Um, so basically that means you have, uh, you have one half occurring twice and all the other Newton slopes um, ha are, have odd denominator. So that's, those are of course much higher co-dimension, but um, there are, it means there are other Newton polygons for which this phenomenon kicks in. The proof of this really is somehow too attic in nature, regardless of what the point is. Is that useful computationally? Uh, I don't know if it's useful computationally. It does show up in the LMFDB, right? You can find examples in, in dimension four um, where the, that have this Newton polygon. And you can check that those guys, in fact, all have angle rank either G or at least G minus one. Well, I guess it's even, so angle rank, they, they all have angle rank four. I think I did check that. Um, so. Yeah, so let me kind of explain one of the ingredients that go into the proof of this. Um, we learned a lot about this from, of course, there's lots of literature about this. Um, there's a fairly recent paper by Zarkin um, that explains this uh, in, in a lot of detail. And so we, we learned a lot by reading this paper. So um, there's this notion of the slope vectors. Um, there's a kind of, let me, uh, so the way the slope vectors are defined is, so I'm gonna take a subspace, I'm gonna form a subspace of Q to the G. So this is a G dimensional vector space over the rational numbers. Um, it's gonna be the vector subspace spanned by things of the following form. So I'm gonna write, um, let me shift notation slightly here and try to bring it here to matching. So I'm going to write beta i here oops. In, in this, in the following, I, all right, I was writing alphas for my Fermanius eigenvalues. I'm going to write beta i for alpha i divided by alpha i bar. This is sort of a convenience. Um, uh, for normalization purposes. Uh, so the slope vector is going to be I take the valuations of beta one through beta g for each valuation v of you know this field above p. And since it's a subspace, I don't have to worry about normalization. Um, so, right in general, if if this if this field has a large Galois group, then there are potentially lots of valuations above p. Um, and um, right, so for example, if uh, you know if if this if this if this Galois group is the full symmetric group on G generators then any vector you write down here, um, all of its permutations will appear. And so that forces the space to be pretty big because right, it's a representation, right? And now you can sort of see that something interesting is happening here with some group theory because there's a group action on here. And um, the key point here is that the dimension of V is gonna be equal to the angle rank. So the angle rank is the dimension of a certain irreducible representation of some finite group over Q, some Q irreducible representation 
or well, some Q representation, it's not irreducible necessarily, uh, some Q representation of some finite group. And so now you can start to see that there are very severe constraints on the possible dimensions of such representations. Um, and now this starts to explain why some of the answers start to look the way they do. It's because, you know, for instance, if, um, right, so for example, well, let me, let me do this on the next slide. This is sort of where the action happens. So now this is all useful because there's this Gawa action that acts on uh, this, this space. So if I take G to be the Gawa group of Q adjoin the alphas over Q, so now G sits inside the following thing, right? I take the semi-direct product of um, Z2 to the G uh, sim uh, semi-direct. I guess it's a wreath product. And these are not abelian, so I'm going to write ones here. So G sits in, naturally sits inside a thing like this by, by its permutation action. So this SG, this is giving me the action. This is sort of the action on the betas. Um, and these are, of course, the actions fixing the beta. This part is the actions fixing the betas. So I'm going to get some group that I call G bar over here. And I get some something over here that's the, the kernel of the projection to SG. So I'm going to call so C is a is an F2 vector space. I'm going to call this the code of the abelian variety. And I mean code in the sense of coding theory. This is like a binary linear code. Um, this is a useful thing to remember when you're looking up group theory references because a lot of the motivation for finite group theory was its interaction with binary linear codes, because binary linear codes have obvious applications outside of mathematics. Um, so when you're looking up kind of interesting group theory, sometimes you find it in the coding theory literature. And um, yeah, so the point is that uh, G uh, acts, on this V, uh, the, the space V that the space of the space of slope vectors, and so uh, you know constraints on so constraints on dimensions of G representations imply constraints on angle rings. Uh, given G. So for example, this is one way you can recover Tonkaev's theorem using the fact that, you know, G bar, uh, right? So absolutely irreducible is implying that, so the absolutely irreducible condition um, is implying that uh, G bar is transitive. And now you have a if you have a transitive permutation action, if you have a transitive permutation action of degree p, um, there aren't very many of those. So that's kind of the nature of, of proofs in this business. So okay, so let me. Uh, by the way, how long am I? How long am I supposed to talk until? I can kind of taper this off at any re at more or less any point right after this. So slide. we feel comfortable interrupting you. So one o'clock is okay. So you know, roughly ten minutes. Or so. Okay. So that means I actually will. Right. I'm, I'm used to giving. We have a fifty minutes somewhere, so I'm used to kind of tapering off after fifty minutes. Um, yeah. So I can state some theorems here. Um, in, in, in particular, I want to talk about the effect of this of this code. Um, so in particular, um, we have some results that say, the, so here's a theorem. Um, um, so, and this theorem is actually stronger than this, but let me state an easy version of it for a moment. 
Uh, so suppose G bar acts primitively. So a reminder from group theory, right? Transitively means that any element can be carried to any other element in the set. Primitively means um, there's no partition of this uh, set that's kind of acted upon by the group. Um, so there's no part there's no way to partition these things in some way that's kind of where parts are always carried to parts, except you know in the trivial way where you either everybody is in one partition or everybody's in their own partition. You mean like okay, so it doesn't factor through SA cross SB. Uh, right. It mean, no. It means that it doesn't factor through the. Uh, it doesn't factor through the wreath product of. Uh, uh, what is it? Oh, yes. SA wreath SB where A times B equals G. Okay. Oh, G is not prime. Okay. G is not prime anymore. Okay. G is general. Yeah. So this is right. So trans. So when G is prime, the transitive implies primitive, and so that this is. So this will imply. This will contain concave, but this is a much stronger statement. Um. So I, I should say something about the uh, the code. The code maybe um, so right. There is an element that's always present in the code, which is there's always a complex conjugation, right? This, this field generated by the Frobenius eigenvalues. It's a CM field. If you if you in, in the complex numbers, if you do conjugation, you flip all the alphas. None of them is real. So um, and that's an element of the Galois group. Uh, which is sitting in that that Z two part, and it's the element with with a you know with a one everywhere or a minus one if you want to think of those as plus minus one. So right, so C always contains the sort of the all ones vector. This corresponding to corresponding to complex conjugation. So if so, I'll say that C is trivial if this is the only thing it contains. So if C is if C is not equal to the span of the all ones vector, so if C is not equal to the span of the all ones vector, uh, then A has maximum. So this is again uh, a criterion that you can apply in a great many cases, including you know. Just a huge, a huge swath of the LMFDB. Um, so, because you know, most of the time, most of the time, sort of generically, uh, C is going to be as big as possible. C is typically the whole thing, um, and G bar is typically the whole SG. So, certainly, this is true in those cases. But in fact, you can get away with much less. Um, so this is a, this is basically saying that cases that don't have maximal angle rank are very, very special. Um, there are very restrict it, it's uh, if you go looking kind of at random for maximal angle rank, this sort of this sort of structure is is going to kind of come up a lot and it's going to tell you most of, most of the things you're sampling are not going to have maximal angle rank, or are not going to fail or will have maximal angle rank. And so the exceptional cases that are interesting cases of the data structure are quite hard to find by searching randomly. Maximal angle rank means G. Yeah, ma maximal angle rank means G. Um, right, because I said the angle rank can't be any larger. So yeah. Uh, so yeah, in particular, you can in cases where say Tonkaev or Lenstra-Zarhin don't uh, quite give you maximal angle rank. This criterion often kicks in um, and lets you check that you actually do have maximum. Is there an actual example for G odd where the angle rank, where the Zarin and Lentris criterion? Yes. So you can find, for example, in LMFDB, uh, yeah, I think if you look at like dimension, if you look at uh, dimension five over F2, absolutely irreducible, you can find cases where the angle rank is four. Right. Um, yeah, or if you dimension three, you can find cases where the angle rank is two. Um, yeah, you can, those examples are available. And yeah, basically all the things that are allowed seem to show up in data already over F2. 
So that's a nice thing about having numerics is that you can, if, if you think, if you're wondering whether, you know, some condition is necessary, you can just inspect a little bit of data uh, and, and confirm that. Uh, let's see, uh, do I have another theorem that I wanted to state? Um, I mean, I can just, I'll just point out that, um, actually maybe what I'll do here is I'll just jump to the last theorem, which is this effective, um, this sort of effective version of a theorem of Zardin. So, um, so this is sort of effective, an effectivization of a theorem of Zarkin from. Yeah, let me, sorry, let me move to that. So the title of this is not gonna match, but it's okay. Okay, so this theorem says the following. So A is gonna be, again, an absolutely simple Abelian variety over FQ. Of dimension G, uh, the Fraubach Frobenius eigenvalues, alpha one to alpha G, alpha two G. Uh, G is the Galois group. Um, let delta be the angle rank. Um, then uh, the vectors. So, okay, I'm gonna state this in terms of the angle rank, but of course the angle rank is bounded by G. So if you wanna bound, well, you don't need to know the angle rank in advance, you just put, you can just, uh, you can just maximize this. So the vectors for which, the integer vectors for which alpha one to the E1 times alpha two G to the E two G, um, our integer powers of Q. So these are sort of the multiplicative relations that we were worried about at the beginning. Um, these are generated, this, the space of these guys are generated by the vectors um, of a total of weight, meaning sort of sum of the coefficients at most uh, some, some expression here, which is basically order of g to the fourth uh, times some less relevant term. So yeah, so remember order of g is bounded by two to the g times g factorial. So as g grows, this is kind of a big number, but at least it's it's finite. When g is small, it's actually not terrible. Um, you could even you could actually kind of search this far. Um, in practice, you can do better than this. In any explicit instance, you can kind of do better, but this there, you can you can give a general analysis of slope vectors that say that somehow the worst case scenario you can give a bound um, on on how much you on how far you have to go. This actually uses some, if I remember correctly, the lemma that we used here actually comes from something like quantum information theory. Um, it, you have to bound like you know you're doing some row, you're doing like a reduction of an integer matrix to Smith normal form, and you want to bound. Sort of how big the terms are, and if I remember correctly, that there was some PhD thesis in quantum information theory that actually derived this. So that was a, a neat connection. Um, but it's purely a it's purely a linear algebra statement. So, right. uh, yeah. So I think maybe that's the last thing I'll, I'll say. So I'll go ahead and stop here.